Well, Father, I thank you that he is here today, that he's blessed, that he's healed, and we thank you, God, for using him mightily to bring forth the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, we're going to be talking about that this morning. Do we have the title up? So this is going to be the last uh, sermon in the series that I've been preaching since October. Uh, preparing us for next year, we've been talking about 2020 vision. Amen? Okay, so we're talking about 2020 vision. The title of our message this week is Focus Forward. When we started in October, we talked about that we need to be led, guided by the Spirit. And I got to thank the Fosters that actually gave me a really cool shirt, which I was going to wear today, and I forgot because I'm not feeling great. Uh, about God's positioning spirit. That's the GPS you need to use, right? Because your GPS on your phone is going to like lead you into a pond. If you ever watch The Office, you understand that reference. But um, we need God's positioning spirit to guide us through this life as we walk out our salvation with Christ. And the last time I preached in November, we talked about the meaning of life, which has seemingly been this big mystery for all this time. But it's simple, and that is to fellowship with God. That is why God created us, is to fellowship with us. And so if we understand that we need to be led by him, and then we understand that we need to be fellowshipping with him, then that ties into what we're going to be talking about today, which is focus forward. So here's the question today. Who's excited to be at church this morning? All right. Who's not excited to be here but came anyway? Thank you for being here. Can we just be real today? All right. Who's uh, who, who didn't want to be here and didn't come? Oh, wait, that doesn't work. When you're watching this later, that was you. There's a story, a joke. Some of y'all probably heard this. Uh, a woman went to wake up her husband to get ready for church one morning and uh, said, come on, honey, it's time to get up. You got to get ready for church because I don't really want to go. He's like, no, you got to go. He's like, no, I don't want to go today. I just want to stay in bed. I want to lay around. I want to watch football. I don't want to go to church today. Just one Sunday, I don't want to go. She's like, you have to go. Why do I have to go? You have to go. You're the pastor. But that's real, okay? That's real. And I want to get real today because I want our faith to be practical because if it's not practical, then it doesn't really matter too much in our lives, Practical means what happens in our lives on a regular basis. What can we apply? What can we relate to? What can we actually make real for us? And our faith has to be practical. And so what that means is that we have to be honest. We have to be honest about how we feel sometimes. I don't feel good. Yesterday I didn't feel good all day long. But my wife was decorating for Christmas. So I made myself get up and help to the extent that I was able to and in a very grumpy mood, go, okay, let's go get some lights on the house. You know, praise God, Jesus' birthday. Okay. I'm pretty sure it wasn't in December anyway, but lights, yay. I was not feeling good at all, but I made myself get up and do some things. You ever make yourself go to work when you don't feel like going to work? Why? Because you won't get paid, Right? Because you want to get paid, and because you have responsibilities. There's times when I'm getting ready to go to work, and Kenny's like, just play hooky. I'm like, I can't. I have stuff I have to do. I have responsibilities that I have to do. So I get up, and I make myself go. There's an old saying that I developed when I was at TBI, to whom much is given, much is required. So you get your butt up even when you're tired. That's reality. That's the, the, the nitty-gritty of our lives. But... Why are you here today if you didn't feel like coming to church? Or maybe a better question is, why aren't others here today? You know, there's this, this strange separation that we tend to have when it comes to our secular lives and our ecclesiastical lives, our, our church lives or our spiritual lives. And I think it's because we tend to not be realistic and and face reality of how we actually feel, and allow that to engage with our spiritual life. Sometimes you aren't always going to feel like coming to church. Sometimes you're not always going to feel like leading a small group, right? Teaching in saint school, leading worship, getting up here to preach, ushering without hitting someone upside the back of the head. Isn't that right, Brother C.? 
Sometimes you don't feel like it. And so why do we do some things sometimes when we do feel like it and when we don't? When we make ourselves get up and go to work and get up and do other things, get up and cook dinner for our kids, what have you, do the laundry, all of these things, fold the laundry. If you go to my house, that's a, that's a rarity. We often don't feel like folding laundry. But when we make ourselves do that, that's because we are finding something in ourselves that finds commitment and determination and perseverance and all of these that are really bad words in our modern vernacular, right? You can't tell anyone to be, be disciplined. You can't tell anybody to, to you know, pick themselves up by their bootstraps, John. You can't tell them to do things according to what's right and wrong. And, and no, they got to be led by their feelings, even if that feels like they identify as a female cat from Persia or something like that. Because that's how they feel, John. That's how they feel. And that's bogus. But we can fall into that trap within the church. We can say, I don't feel like it. And it often happens. That's why there's so many people not here on the weekend of Thanksgiving. Because after turkey and shopping and those priorities in their lives, church was not that high. So here on December 1st, as we welcome in the month in which we celebrate the greatest gift that God's ever given us, lots of people have slept in this morning because they didn't feel like coming. And I want to shake you out of that. That's why we're talking about vision. In Habakkuk 2.2, we should know this. We've been talking about vision. Habakkuk says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he who... He may run who reads it. Make it plain so that he may run who reads it. There's this thing about vision that I want us to understand. Vision is the thing that will make you do something you don't feel like doing. Leslie, I'm glad you shared this morning. I'm going to use you as an example. That's what happens when you go to up here and you share on the microphone. You then get to be used as an example. But Leslie, you said you're working with someone now, a doctor, a, a health coach, right? And that you are daily looking at things, at metrics. Do you know that works? That works. Do you know why that works? Because it's front of mind. Because it's before you. Because it's plainly written so that you can run as you read it. When I started a weight loss journey, I realized that the more disciplined I was in tracking my progress the more disciplined I was in everything else. I was disciplined in what I ate if I logged it. You know? Some people say, oh, you don't need to count calories. No, it was good for me because I was front of mind. What I was eating, what I was putting into my body was front of mind. And when I was not diligent in doing that and writing it down, well, then I tended to overeat. When I was working out and I was logging turn on my Apple Watch and go hit the gym, and I was logging and keeping track of what exercises benefited me the most, then I could get on the scale and see the weight drop, and that was motivating. But all of these things were just little road signs, guideposts on the journey because I had a goal, a vision in front of me. If I'm honest, it was Chris Evans just playing Captain America because the guy is ripped, right? I'm like, yeah, okay, well, if Chris Evans can do it, why not? To be healthy, to have this vision of what you can accomplish, you begin to change your life, right? And you begin to keep track of things, and you have it at the forefront of your mind, and when you do that, it keeps you on the straight and narrow, we like to say, right? What does that mean, on the straight and narrow? It's from Scripture, right? Wide is one path, narrow is another. Easy is one way, difficult is the other. We say in our vernacular this, this common phrase to stay on the straight and narrow. And what that means is that it is a finite, specified part path for us to follow that is difficult. The straight and narrow is a difficult path. And you know what? Guess what? It's actually not very straight. It kind of looks like this, this meandering thing through life because we're following God through all of the ups and downs. You ever see the meme on Facebook where it's like our expectation is this straight line? But the reality is all of these ups and downs as we go up the mountain. My weight loss looked like that, actually. It, it looks like it's starting here, and it ends here. But if you look at the chart, it goes like this. Up here, that's Thanksgiving. Christmas. 
So we have to be focused on certain things. And we're going to deal with times where we simply don't want or don't feel like we can accomplish what God has set before us. Or more often, it's not even a feeling of not being able to accomplish what God has set before us or that we don't want to do it. The truth of the matter is we often just want to do something else. Like watch football, watch TV, go to the movies, engage in behavior we know is wrong and not edifying, what have you. Randall said it when he taught on Wednesday night a few weeks ago, that we can have whatever we want in God, right? We want to experience God to a great extent. We want to flow in the glory and the power that God has for us. We can do that. We can do that. God's made it available. He wants us to flow in that way. He wants us to do that. So if we're not, then the question simply honestly becomes, do we really want it? And that's the difficult question because that's where the rubber hits the road. I want to give you an example from the Apostle Paul's life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to start reading at verse 23. You can turn there if you like or you can follow along on the screen. Paul's admonishing the church about these false prophets. And he says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. This guy had a lot of perils. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil, he left out in perils among the church, but I'm sure that happened too. In sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Boy, we got it rough, don't we? We read just some of the trials that the Apostle Paul went through as he ministered the gospel. We in America, more so than anywhere else in the world, tend to sanitize the gospel that we don't have to suffer for Jesus' sake, which is weird because he promised that we would. So if he promised that we would suffer, that we would go through trials and tribulations, and we then see this played out in the church fathers, the very apostles, Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, going through all these things as he ministered under the power and the glory of God, should we then understand that we might need within us some fortitude to withstand trials, and yet when we don't even feel like doing it, watch God move in our midst. I was so blessed last November, or this this last month when I preached, because we were preaching on the presence of God, and it was my intense goal to try to build God up so big in your minds that your faith would be strong enough to overcome anything. We talked about the fact that when we pray for sickness and we travail over these things, that we do God a disservice and we struggle in our faith because it's not more difficult for God to heal cancer than it is to heal a headache. And what blessed me is that Christian, in his pain with his injury to his foot, came up here, hobbled up here, and we had the youth pray for him. A simple prayer, and God healed him like that. And what really made me so encouraged about that was that I didn't feel like it. You know what I mean? I didn't feel anything. I had faith, and I had hope that God would honor our prayer, but there was no, at that particular moment, there were no goosebumps. You know what I mean? There were no goosebumps, but the glory of God was with us. And then there's other times where the, the, the presence of God is so comforting, and it's in those times where we feel often our lowest that we feel him close to us. But have you ever been at a point where you felt your lowest and you didn't feel him close to you? We have to understand, just as Paul writes here, all of these things that he went through, that those things that are trials in our life cannot be the thing that pulls us away from God, because if it is, then was our faith counterfeit? Was it simply based upon feelings? 
I read an article recently that warned churches that some, you have to be careful. Sometimes your faith can look more pagan than Christian. When we get so caught up only in feeling and we are not driven by this persevering spirit within us that when we don't feel God, we stop. Well, then that's not Christianity. Paul continues in the next chapter of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. He says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, something he struggled with on a daily basis, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, this messes with most of our theology. Because most of our theology is that if God wants me to do something, he will make a way. No door will be shut. The path will be easy. And that if there's something upon me, God would surely deliver me because that is his promise. But we see here with, with Paul, his response to him is not to take away the thing he's struggling with. His response is to say, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul gives context to this because he's saying, if not for this, I probably would be too much in my own head. I would think too highly of myself. And God understanding me has brought this affliction upon me to keep me humble so that when I'm weak, he can be strong. He goes on to say, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I, you ready for this one? This is going to mess with your theology because therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, we have examples in the Bible, in narratives of people struggling with what God's called them to do because of how they felt. Jonah, great example of this, right? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. In Jonah 1, it says, Now the world, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their weak, wickedness has come, upon, come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He was just a stupid prophet, wasn't he? Like, I'll just go to a different city. I'm sure the Lord won't be there. Moron. Let's see if anyone remembers this. The proof that Phil Vischer is great when it comes to... Uh, teaching Bible stories to stick with people, because Jonah was a prophet, <laughs> but he really never got it. Sad but true. If you watch him, you can spot it. A doodly do. He did not get the point. That's from Veggie Tales, if you didn't know that. One of my key sources for Bible stories is Veggie Tales. But Jonah went away from where God had called him to. Now, Jonah was a prophet of the Lord. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon specific people that held office within the church as ordained by God. And in the midst of this, Jonah says, nope, I am going to ignore the word of the Lord. I don't feel like going over there to Nineveh. And instead, I'm going to go somewhere else that the Lord can't find me because he's stupid. We talked about that. Jonah was operating away from God's calling, and yet he still called himself a prophet. Because, and here's something that you got to be careful of, sometimes your position will replace your vision. I'm going to say that again. Your position can replace your vision. People begin to operate within this office that they have, this calling they have, this position that they have. Perhaps it's within a church. Perhaps it's at work. 
And what happens is you grow so comfortable with the trappings that you have, these surroundings and this process, this understanding that you have of what you're supposed to be doing, that your vision that God gave you gets lost in the day-to-day of what you're doing. And so we got to be careful. I'm going to give you another example that's a very different example. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, Jesus has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's sorrowful, and he's praying, he's travailing. In verse 38, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You know, there's actually debate about this in theological circles. Most of the people that debate what this means, I think, are, again, stupid. But, you know, it seems clear in context that what Jesus is struggling with is what awaits him. He knows what's coming. His vision is to see humanity redeemed to the Father by his blood, by his sacrifice, to make this way of uniting humanity with the Father. This is what we were talking about last time when I preached, that the meaning of life is for us to have fellowship, but sin had separated us, had, past tense, no longer, sin had separated us from the Father. And so Jesus came to bear our, our, our burdens upon him, our pain, our sickness, and ultimately our sin. And yet the humanity in him, because he was all God and he was all man, The humanity in him, his feelings of dread, he felt dread. We need to remember the humanity of Christ because that is one of the most significant aspects of the fact that he was God and he was also man. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man, which means he felt as we do. He had feelings, and his feelings did not control him. So as he felt this sorrow, he cried out to the Father, if there's any way that we can do this without me having to deal with the torture and death and spiritual pain that I'm about to go through, that would be great. But if there's not, then I do it anyway. Then I do it anyway. Because he says, not as I will, but as you will. Have you ever stopped to think about that? The fact that Jesus is talking about his will possibly being different than the Father's will in that particular moment in time. Everything we'd seen has been Jesus saying, I do as the Father, as I see the Father do. And at this point, when he faces dread that none of us can fathom, is when he begins to have this will that's maybe contrary, different than what the Father's will is. And yet he says, not as I will, but as you will. And that's what so many of us need to have in our lives, not as I will, but as you will. And we can say that, but we so often give it lip service because a lot of times we expect God's will to be the same as our will, truth be told, right? Not as I will, Lord, but as you will, wink, and you know that my will is your will. But that's not, that's backward. It's supposed to be his will is our will. A lot of this comes down to what we often talk about as walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. In Galatians 5, I didn't give this to Lucas, so sorry. In verse 16, Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. That's that God's positioning satellite, right? Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, but is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, 
envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Basically, he just described a lot of people's thanksgiving. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed, here we go, the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross, crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Amen? Isn't that good? Paul has defined for us what our lives should look like. Now, if we are then walking according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, then that means that we are following the unction and guidance of the Spirit and the Word of God and not our feelings, right? Say it with me, feelings. We're not following our, air quotes, feelings. And this is important, and here's where we often get it wrong. We also feel the presence of God, right? We feel the presence of God in our lives. And this guidance, this feeling can guide us through so much of these difficult things that we, we encounter, these challenges that we face. But what happens when you face a challenge and you don't feel the presence of God? Or what if you are called to minister and you don't feel the presence of God? What if you are supposed to preach on the first Sunday of the month and you're almost throwing up the day before, so you certainly don't feel the presence of God? I didn't feel the presence of God yesterday. I felt something entirely different, let me assure you. Multiple times throughout the day. So what do you do? Do you then say, well, I stop because I don't feel the presence of God? When we're on a journey... This is important. It's an example, but it's an important metaphor for this. When you're on a journey and you know where you're supposed to go and you know how you're supposed to get there and you're on your way to getting there, but in the midst of the journey, you just feel tired and you don't want to go anymore, do you then stop and turn around and go the other way? No, you keep going, right? You know, I, I have to give it to, uh, to Candy and to Jonathan right now. I pray for them because I totally identify with what they are feeling right now because both Candy and Jonathan are getting close to graduation and so they are dealing with what's called senioritis and I went through senioritis and senioritis kind of looks like this when you're supposed to graduate in May and you're in a class you hate in March you're just like I don't care anymore I don't care if I get an A on this paper I don't care if I get a B I don't care if I get a C I don't care I'm just turning it in and I want to be so done with it all that's what senioritis looks like because your feelings are overwhelming you. But if you want to graduate, guess what? You suck it up. You suck it up and you get her done. You go on, on the path that you set before yourself and you complete the task ahead of you. And so we have to understand that we cannot be led by our feelings. We cannot be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, the Bible says. That happens when we are led solely by our feelings. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 is one of my favorite scriptures. It was the first scripture I ever memorized. It was the first scripture that God ever revealed to me in the Bible when I was 16 years old. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And the part that I always jumped out to me was to not lean on your own understandings. Not lean on your own understandings. We don't trust in what we can figure out. We don't trust in the ideas that we come up with on our own. We don't trust in how we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. We trust in the Lord. We trust in the Lord. We don't trust in ourselves. We don't trust in ourselves. When Christian was healed... It wasn't because of any of the kids that were praying. It wasn't because Lucas, who had the microphone. It was because of God. And we can sit here all day long and try to figure out exactly how that worked, but it's God's sovereignty and his power that caused it to happen. And while we were being, it was obedient. That's why obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice is all caught up in feeling, right? Woe is me, everything that I'm sacrificing. And God just wants us to obey instead. He just wants us to obey instead. 
Can you put up the 2020 vision thing again? Because here's what I want you guys to understand. As we go into this new year in 2020, I don't want you to be led by your feelings. I don't want you to be led by your emotions. And I don't want you to be led by when you do or do not feel the Spirit. I want you to be led by what you heard from God and what you read in the Word. Amen? Because there will be moments, Randall's been sharing with us about these awesome stories where God's leading them by the Spirit and, and giving them these words of knowledge and they're going to these places and they're finding these people and they're encountering them, right? But you know what? A lot of times you feel this, but are you confident in it? It's like, okay, I'm going to go out and we call it treasure hunt. We used to call it power evangelism. Right? I'm going to pray. I'm going to get a word from God. And you get this word and you're like, okay. Would you feel like that's God? Well, I don't, hmm, sure. There's not always confidence there, but I love in the story, Randall's like, well, I got this, and someone else got this, and well, that didn't really jive together, but then we went, and then we, it, it did. There was this, the street, and this Walgreens, and the Starbucks, and all these things that we all got separately. Isn't God good? But there was this, this question when you shared with me, Randall, it's like this, this lack of confidence, like, well, you're the one in charge, and I got this, and I'm not too sure. Well, let's go do it anyway. That's what we need to do. Let's go do it anyway. When God speaks to you that you need to have boldness and to minister to the lost, to share your faith with someone, and then you walk up behind someone at the store, and then you don't feel very bold. I don't care how you feel. Amen? So let's look at this. These glasses bringing into focus this word. In business planning, they teach you about lenses. I love these ideals of bringing in these metaphors of how we actually see the world. Who wears glasses? I wear glasses. I wear contacts right now, but I wear glasses. And when I don't have my glasses on, I wouldn't be able to make any of you out. You just, you'd look like a Monet painting. But when I put my glasses on, things come into focus. In business planning, they teach you about lenses, like the lenses on a pair of glasses. And these lenses are a metaphor to help an organization focus on their activities based upon their vision. Is that good? The lenses are the metaphor to help an organization focus on their activities based upon their vision. So it looks kind of like this. If, uh, if a company's vision is to, oh, uh, let's see, bring fashion to somebody, right? Okay. So they're, they're, uh, they're a clothing company, and they want to bring uh, fashion to people who aren't very fashionable. Me, okay? So they, they want to bring fashion to me. Then uh, when it comes to their advertising budget, they would not advertise to people that read fashion magazines. Right? They would advertise in field and stream. Right? Because they're trying to bring... I was told the other day that I'm as, as fashionable as an L.L. Bean catalog. Like I look like a walking L.L. Bean catalog or whatever. But do you get the idea? Their activities should be based upon what their vision is, what their goals are. So if their goal is to reach people who don't know anything about fashion, the last place that they should advertise is a place where people are all about fashion, right? At, at my other job at, at Alamo Music, we went through this exercise. If our, our vision, our goals are this, do our other activities make sense? And what happens when you do this is you begin to clear clutter from your activities because they don't line up with what your vision is. If it's not helping you accomplish your vision, then why are you doing it? Is this making sense yet? It's a powerful exercise for businesses, and it's how businesses ensure that they are doing the right things to remain successful and to grow. And there's a lot of churches that practice this because this is a principle from God that the world has hijacked that we need to take back. 
Because our lenses are a little bit different. They should not come from our understanding because that's what we just read in Proverbs, right? Our lenses should come from God. And God gives us the lens to see through the, based upon the vision that he's given this house, based upon the vision that he's given you to see what the activities are that you should and should not be doing. And when your vision is in focus before you, you see it through the lens of God, then you're going to be able to persevere no matter how you feel. When your vision is before you, you will pursue it. Amen? When your vision is before you, you will pursue it. And so as I conclude today, we're moving into 2020 at the end of this month. Humanity marks time. God sees eternity. God already knows what lays before us. And he has a purpose and a plan for you. He has a vision for your life. And he is already, whether you know it or not, have been moving you into that vision and preparing you for next year. Whether you've realized it or not, God has been preparing you. He's been preparing this house. The messages that God has been bringing forth, the things that God has been doing, he has been doing, orchestrating this in a way to prepare us for what is coming next year. And so we have to understand what our vision is what our corporate vision is, but what your personal vision is. You have to know what God has called you and created you for. That's why we started with understanding God's positioning spirit in your life. He has to guide you, and he guides you because you're close to him. You're in fellowship with him. And when you're in fellowship with God, then nothing that you face can deter you because you are not based upon feelings. You are led by the spirit and by the word of God. So as we move into 2020, let your vision come into focus. Allow those lenses to clear away the things that have taken over in your life as priority that should not be priority. So that you can focus on the priorities God has for you to see your vision accomplished. When our visions are accomplished, the vision of this house is accomplished. Because the vision of this house is to see God move in each of our lives so that out there they experience the presence of God, the fullness of God. Are y'all ready? Are you ready for what God has for you for this next year? Because I'm ready. Sometimes I don't feel ready, but I'm ready. You know what I mean? Do you feel ready? Eh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Amen? Stand to your feet. Pastor, do you want to add anything? Anything to add? Okay. <laughs> I want that to be like this mantra for you guys. Like, I don't feel like it. Doesn't matter. Just tell yourself that, okay? And anytime you, like, you could be talking to your kids or your spouse or something or coworker or even yourself, and you get up and you're like, oh, I don't feel like it. Don't. It doesn't matter. You, you build yourself up. You preach to yourself. You minister to yourself. Amen? I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And if we can get a hold of this, we will see God motivate us through anything. Yvonne, anything. God can see you through it. And anyone in your life, God can see them through it. It doesn't matter what they feel. Amen? Amen. Right, we're going to pray. Before we do, I'm going to invite anyone who still needs prayer to come up to the front so we can pray for you. Does, well, does anyone need prayer this morning? It's probably all the people that stayed home from church. No? All right. Show of hands who didn't come to church this morning? All right. All right, well, then let me pray to dismiss you this morning. Father God, I thank you for Expect a Miracle Church. I thank you for this body of believers, this congregation that has gathered here before you this morning to worship you, to hear your word. Father, I thank you for building us up in our spirit, edifying us to focus on you and to persevere in our faith. Lord, I pray that as we go out from this place that you would use each and every one of us mightily, whether or not we feel like being used. Give us 
what we need to put ourselves in your hands so that it's not our will, but it's truly your will, which is probably very different from our will, that is done in our lives. So Father, I thank you for that. I thank you that you've poured your spirit out upon all of our flesh. You have filled us with your power, God, to take it to the nations. So let it be done, Lord. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right.